Hey, welcome to another exciting day of Live with the Native Guy. I am your host, the Native Guy. We have a great guest today on the Pow Wow Trail. He is coming from the great Comanche Kiowa Nation. His name is Dr. Cornell Peewawardy. He's a professor of practice in the School of Education at Kansas State University, professor emeritus in Indigenous Studies at Portland State University, and vice chair of the Comanche Nation. He is a profound belief in the power of indigenous education and in the power of higher education and has dedicated his life work to bringing those two forces together to improve both. Dr. P. Wardy retired in 2017 from Portland State University where he served as director of the Indigenous Nation Studies program. Prior to Portland, joining Portland State, he taught at the University of Kansas and was a five-time recipient of the Big 12 Outstanding American Indie Faculty of the Year Award served as the indig first indigenous academic dean of the Comanche Nation College and founded two transformational award-winning magnet schools in St. Paul, Minnesota. Dr. P. Wardy also began his career in education as an elementary teacher and principal on the Navajo Reservation in New Mexico. He's a founding member of the National Association for Multicultural Education, which brings together individuals from all education levels and disciplines from diverse educational institutions who have an interest in multicultural education. Throughout his career, Dr. P. Wardy has been honored extensively for his work recently receiving the 2022 National Indian Education Association Lifetime Achievement Award for his commitment, dedication, and service to students, communities, and Native Education National Conference on Race, Ethnicity, Susan Harjo Systematic Social Justice Awards 2021, Educator of the Year for the Council on Indian Education 2021, AARP Oklahoma Indian Elders How Honors Award 2019, Oregon Indian Educator of the Year in 2017, Portland State John Elliott Allen Outstanding Teaching Award in 2016, uh, Name Carl A. Grant Multicultural Research Award 2011, and Portland State University's Diversity Award in 2011. So presenting the transformational indigenous praxis model for almost three decades at professional conferences across the United States, Dr. P. Wordy has applied his theoretical model sorry, to the work of educational practice, primarily using case, within, with, using case studies with indigenous learner systems and structures in efforts to nurture indigenous epistemologies and on ontologies for creating educational space for indigenous self-determination co-editor of this recent published book of 2022 with teachers college press unsettling colonial unsettling settler colonial education provides a sweeping portrait of case studies emerging practices towards decolonization structures in education you know dr pew wordy he continually remains locally engaged by generating a critical pedag Augie of indigenous communities based on indigenous knowledge. He discusses strategies for community to inform, to heal, to uplift, and raise consciousness. You know, Dr. P. Wardy continues to serve his career throughout professional associations, including here in the city of Lawton Race Relations Commissions, the founder of the Comanche Academy Charter School, for, uh, founder of the Indigenous Peoples Day in Lawton, Oklahoma, First American Museum Knowledge Keepers in OKC, a founding board member of the National Association for Multicultural Education, and the American Indian Studies Advisory Board. He's on the editorial boards of the Tribal Multicultural Education and the American Indian Studies Advisory Board. He's on the ed editorial boards of Tribal College and University Research, uh, Wakaza Saw Review, Journal of Native American Studies Multicultural Perspective, and multicultural magazines. And it's our great honor to bring Dr. Cornell P. Wardy. Hey, thanks for joining us here. It's the DP Studio Colonial Education. We're going to flip that on the screen for you. Now, this is a book you you kind of help edit and everything. It was others. So this book, it actually presents the transformational indigenous praxis model. That's uh, what you've kind of studied in all the years up to this point, as we've kind of learned. And, and it's an uh, innovative framework for promoting and I like how you say it because it's critical conscience thinking that we have toward decolonizing efforts among el educators. And, and that's going to be a key thing we kind of want to reach with our listeners who hear 
what what do you mean and what do we mean by this decolonization and colonization what how can we help listeners who hear hear this and understand what that means in, in when we're teaching this model yes i'd like to uh just go back just a little bit because this has a lot to do with identity identity construction and who we are as um, as native indigenous people uh, my name is cornell pb Wardy. I'm, I'm a citizen of the comanche nation but I'm also half Kiowa and very proud of that coming from the, the Kalati family. And so when you have blended uh, family, you, you begin to understand where you are, where you came from, and, and understand the your story, uh, your, your culture story, and where you came from, um, how you got here, meaning, you know, how you got to uh, the location where we are here in the southwest of Oklahoma. And it helps you understand where you're going to go. And so that, to me, is a, an indigenous education. And so you, in, in public schools, you don't you don't learn all of that. And actually, sometimes when you ask questions, and, and I ask my students, so where are you from, um, what that, to me, frames is a cultural perspective, meaning that, to me, I know where I came from. But when I ask students, like it, when I was at KU at the University of Kansas, I would ask them, where are you from? And they'd say, I'm from Topeka. I'm from Kansas City. I'm from Wichita, Kansas. I'm from Hayes, Kansas. I'm from whatever it may be. And then, you know, sometimes they have the, the, the Kansas University on their sweatshirt. And I refer back to them and said, so you're, um, you're, 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 you're Kansas? Say yes, I'm in Kansas. So, so where are your people? Where are the Kansas people? And she looked at herself. She said, I'm right here. I said, okay, this is a cultural perspective that I'm coming from. So, when I ask the question, where you're coming from, I'm asking the question about culturally, where are you coming from? So, for me, when I say Southwest Oklahoma, um, that's where I'm coming from. I I don't come from Kansas or I don't come from anywhere else. So. But that's the framework where a lot of our mainstream students come from. That has to do with identity and identity construction about who we are. And so, as a, all, all my career has been spent in in a native indigenous education, and it's about creating identity, claiming who we are, and where we come from. And that's the probably the best thing you could do because once you plan schools for the future whether it be a Comanche-centered school, Kiowa-centered school, Apache-centered school, you know, it's about identity. It's about identity construction. So the framework in education is about who are you? Why is it important for you to be Kiowa, to be Comanche, to be Apache in this this day and age, this world? And education can help frame that. Yes. Public schools don't do that. Public schools tend to assimilate you and be like everybody else. And all the and the social um, constructs are all about mainstream and all about speaking English. So it, it really takes away from the the native way of teaching and learning, but really moves into something very Eurocentric and defines what an outcome of a public school education is. It becomes very individualistic, very competitive, very uh, materialistic, and Eurocentric. That to me the outcomes of public education and uh, for us and me and indigenous people that's not what we're about we're about teaching who we are as principled people telling our story uh, from the truth and then moving forward into the future so that's the reason why uh, this book have helped to shake up education against unsettling settler colonialism Wow, I, I start thinking about when you said about the individualistic and things like that. In, in business, you know, we study this I, I, Hofstede model. I don't know if you know if you've read that, that but it's a very it's a base model kind. It, it actually uh, does research and, and it forms I, ideologies and bases, kind of theorems on how societies form. And, and you hit the nail on the head here in the United States. We're a very individualistic society individualistic societies tend to only what can the person who I'm around and what can I get from 
whereas you as you were speaking when i hear about you know where kyle was comanche patsy the different tribes that are around here we were at one time collective societies and as a group collective societies tend to you know what can we accomplish as a group and, and for me when i was hearing that it's pretty interesting because this model as i've kind of perused through some of this book it also talks about uh, educators who are complicit in reproducing ethno stereotypes, racist, racist actions, deficit based ideology, uh, drawing from decades of collaboration with teachers. It, it helps uh, school leaders serving indigenous communities, uh, children in communities, to help them better support development of their critical thinking skills. How important is that, that this, that this model can help? You know, Segi. What I've learned is that the, the, the generator of academic performance in school is high self-esteem. And so when you have teachers that teach with a deficit lens, that, that means that they're, they're going to talk down to you. They're going, not going to lift you up. It's like when I went to high school. Uh, I got talked down to by the teachers and administrators. And then even when my high school counselor at Lawton High asked me what I wanted to do after I graduated from high school, I said, I want to go to college. I want to be the first one in my my, my family uh, forever. <laughs> Not just the uh, first generation, I mean, forever to, to graduate from college. And so, but that didn't seem to be the uh, the um, expectation for um, my college counselor and some of my teachers. And actually, he leaned over to me in his deficit lens and said, hey, he said, do you know Cornell? Um, there's a Votec that's going to be built next year. And by the time you graduate, you might want to do that because you guys are good with your hands. And then, then he, another example, he said, what about joining the Army like your dad? I mean, because you guys make good soldiers. And I thought to myself, and I did challenge because, you know, my mind wasn't as critical as it is today, but that's such a deficit lens that many of us grow up, even today, being told we can't go on and perform in the academic and, and creative ways because of this deficit syndrome that we have. And so I, I try to eliminate that and I try to, to actually count coup today, which means that I, I can go back and, and, and show my counselors and my teachers who said, hey, I'm going to show you my diploma. I'm going to show you this award because in my day, you said I couldn't do this. And so I just count coup in every award that I win. I don't go and show it in their face or anything. I just put it in my house and display it, put it in my curriculum vita so I can look at it and say, you know, there was a day that my uh, teachers and my principal said I couldn't even go to college. But I don't want any Native child to grow up in that kind of way. That's why we need to uplift everybody and change the system and give them hope. That's a pretty powerful statement you just said. Because when you were saying all those things, there was this, that's what my teachers were telling me up in Lawrence, Kansas when I was a child. They were telling me I would be better working in a factory. I'd be better working hard labor. I couldn't go to college. But you also said something about those teachers who were actually there supporting. And I had those. And, and those are the ones who actually are the reason why I probably went to college. Because there are teachers who actually do care. They might not be of the same. But the aha moment you just had. Because I thought some of the things that you described, I went through them the exact same time. And this is, you know, this is not that old either. But just to think about that, that, that this is actually something that's going on for a long time. And, and this work that you have. You know, about this book, we're talking about unsettling settler colonial education, the transformational indigenous practice model, multi educational series. It's uh, the editor's Cornell, Dr. Cornell P. Wordy and Elise. It was uh, Robin Zape Tahola Minthorn. Uh, they are all ones who helped uh, write this book and, and lots of study and research into this book. So, what are some of the, the information before we really start looking in and, and getting an idea what this model is what what are some other things about unsettling settler colonial education because you just hit some key aspects that maybe some people like me that was an aha moment that you just gave me oh i didn't ever think about that this this how do we say deficit-based ideology 
I, I mean that how can we get more to under because for me that just something like that simple to help others to understand that if you that's an experience that even my children I've heard some of that today so it still goes on well thank you very much for those questions I think that uh, in retrospect I look at my life and the way that I grew up and it's not any different than many other children that are here because most of us grow up in public school setting and um, my concern is that if most of the native kids grow up in public schools who's teaching them who are the teachers do they look like them do they talk like them do they give them encouragement that they engage in in ceremony for the things that they do or are they just ivy tower just stay at the school and just call home and things like that that's not teaching pedagogy that i am used to but it's the kind that i, I desire to and so when when i when i sing a song or when i start class with meditation it's all about decolonizing your mind and so when i began to study uh, more about decolonization when i was a professor at the university of kansas I began to take models from social work and integrate what I've already knew in uh, multicultural education and put these models together that I knew that were empowering our, our people to, to be creative and, 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 and teach from the strength perspective. And so that's how I framed this, this, this model and put it together in teacher education because I saw how many uh, teachers were coming into the profession they were so unconscious about culture, so unconscious about their identity, and they were just espousing all those mainstream uh, principles that I shared with you before, being individualistic, very Eurocentric, very um, competitive, and materialistic. Those things are not about uh, a whole child. It's not about teaching in an indigenous way. So I just thought I'd share that with you that I, I brought professions together in models because those teachers were um, they, they kept asking questions and about why they had to take courses on anything that was ethnic and a lot of those teachers uh, the, 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 I call them pre-service there they were uh, actually young students who were going to be teachers they were from West Kansas Western Kansas and they said, you know, uh, Doctor of uh, Humanity, that you know where I am, what I'm going back to. There, there are no students of color; everybody's white. And I thought to myself, well, that's the reason why you need this course. You know, you're not going to believe live there in a bubble for the rest of your life. The society is changed, and we live in a global society. I want to prepare you for a global society, not to stay in your bubble. And so that. That's, but that's where it was, and that's the reason why uh, this model is, is, it works, because it brings together case studies from early childhood all the way to higher education and adult education. They were all saying the same thing, that there's structural inequality in the classroom, in, in, in the strategic planning, uh, that has nothing to do aimed at uh, improving the academic achievement of Native and Indigenous students, and it's, public, it's mostly public. That's that's a key thing because this book again we're going to key these words challenges, it's a challenge and and, and the biggest thing too is it's going to why do why do you need to challenge your community the teachers and the public and all why do they need to be challenged to be engaged why why is that important part of this model to work? It's just models for everybody. It's just not this for native uh, teachers, but I think that the ones that own it the, the most are the, the native population because it becomes holistic. And that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to design um, a curriculum in schooling that is holistic rather than something structural like uh, like American public schools, which are based on, on a military model, actually. And so uh, we want to get out of that extinction of, um, of our, our people. Education for extinction. That's what the uh, the Bureau of Indian Affairs started their boarding schools to try to liberate and and give emancipation curriculum so we can get away from that by using this model which is framed from a decolonized um, uh, framework. And what I meant by decolonize is to, is to mean to, to go take away from a Eurocentric uh, framework 
um, not only just within the framework, but also in, in the language, and to try to move into your native indigenous language, whether it be very um, a, a dual language, moving towards uh, uh, immersion, so they can have a, an opportunity to reclaim your language and use that in, in teaching and learning for everybody. So that that's really the model, and that's the challenge we have, and that's what's happening today with all the uh, indigenous charter schools that are happening around the around the country. I just happen to be a part of um, the Comanche Academy Charter School, being one of the founders of that. But I'm also working with uh, the new up-and-coming one for the Cheyenne Arapaho, and also the one in Oklahoma City called the Sovereign. Um, community school but the models are all the same uh, they're doing well and across the country they're outperforming the public schools uh, by design because they integrate a holistic model and they use dual uh, language instruction at the same time so that is a taste of success but it takes us away from the Eurocentric design school and that's what you want to hear is success and, and building this model uh, while we get you a, a little break here for a second, Dr. Peewardy, uh, this book we're talking to Dr. Cornell Peewardy uh, of the Comanche Kiowa Tribe. He's a very distinguished educator. He's uh, helped edit this book, Unsettling Settler Colonial Education: The Transformation Indigenous Practice Model that you see on the screen. There, it's uh, very, very challenging, and, and it challenged you, the reader and those who kind of read this to to understand what it means to to not be so complicit to the things that are going on how we've been taught because you brought about the militaries and things like that what about the religious things too you know with the with the boarding schools the churches and them helping with these schools and everything is that kind of some of the model too that kind of helps key in with the holistic learning with the tribal especially the because again those kind of things too that people if they know their history well the churches and those kind of work together does that kind of help with the holistic point of this book yes it does I'm glad you mentioned that because it is also one of the barriers today a lot of people especially educators don't like to talk about how the, the they should confront the problems that we have particularly in, in native indigenous education today because there's this uh, I think a religious hegemony what I call the uh, the way that we try to teach frame for my ideologies of religion that is in place and it started with the uh, the interrupting of our of our culture and our language and that product was the the bi boarding schools they 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 recruited our children far from home and um, they didn't let them go home for years um, i'm talking about the first one being carlisle uh, indian boarding school in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, and then it sparked other ones. And all these uh, boarding schools started from um, abandoned army forts. And of course, there was no new new construction for Indian schools back then. It was all anything left over. And so that's the kind of design that uh, that, that the, these boarding schools. And of course, there was no native employees whatsoever. But you you went in. You were your religion was changed. Um, it was uh, probably immersed either Protestant or Catholic, whoever the sponsor was from at that time, and then you were um, you were uh, restricted from uh, participating in culture, and by law you were punished if you spoke your language, tribal language, and you had nothing to do with ceremony at all. If you were found to uh, to do uh, sing or dance, uh, you were severely punished. And you would never go home, and so that's that's the uh, that's the story of the Bureau of Indian Affairs boarding schools that we're still grieving about today. And so that caused this intergenerational grief, and it caused the soul wound within the 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 the, the nations, the, the tribal nations. And that's what we're trying to rebound rebound from, and that's called um, recovery from intergenerational grief powerful stuff and, and as we try to recover we kind of want to segue into this because it kind of goes into the transactional uh indigenous praxis model it, there's four steps to this correct that we have and so i'm going to sit here because again the book that we're talking about 
unsettling settler colonial education. It introduces this model as a structure that helps support educators in decolonizing and indigenizing their practices. It provides examples of how pathway making across a variety of settings take place. On the TIPM continuum, it highlights a diverse group of authors who are making contributions to the transformation agendas of indigenous knowledge. Actually, we're introduced to that right away in the book, which is pretty nice. It includes a brief agendas of indigenous knowledges and ways of knowing, a summary of the TIPM dimensions with examples of challenges that educators face as they expand their critical consciousness. It follows native oral traditions by sharing lessons, research, and personal life lived experience. Sorry, it takes me a while to learn how to read. Identifies the deficit-based ideological underpinnings that frame indigenous students' experiences and employs a metaphor of wave jumping to illustrate how educators working to decolonize their practice can gain forward momentum with time and energy while facing resistance. And that's some of the things that this model does. And so we're going to pull that on the screen. This is going to be an awesome time because we're going to get to see uh, Dr. Pewell where he kind of explains some of these different models as we get this ready here. And let's take a look at this one now. This is the model that we're talking about. How wave jumping can spin up or speed up your transformational indigenous practices progress. So let's let people know before you get on screen what they're looking at here, Dr. Peter Wardy. Okay. Um, what I what this is uh, this is built upon this uh, teacher education model that I designed you know years ago when I was at the University of Kansas. Hey, this is and, a uh, um, transformational indigenous practices model. And um, it has four, four dimensions, one, two, three, and, and four. Uh, the, the very top one is that, that very, I think, way up, up here. There's four dimensions. And dimensions, what I call is the, the first one is, uh, oh, by the way, I, I put this together to help what I call uh, conserve and save energy and time simultaneously. Just looking at uh, how much time people have in their life. So this is the uh, the model that I tried to design. And it was influenced uh, with my time that I spent in the northwest coast with the canoe tribes because they, they say the high tide brings in uh, the boat. So I looked at the metaphor from the canoe cultures and how they work together in a canoe culture. And then what I call these togetherness, I call them cohorts. How cohorts can work together and, and help engage in their critical thinking and challenges. So they're like study groups. So I have four little study groups as they move forward. And the first one is a foundation approach because all the education And then a sense that inclines to more critical thinking. Because my theory is that the more critical thinking in theory will lead to practice. And so, but along the way, you're going to get a lot of resistance. So note that on this design, the arrows are inverted. It means you're going to get resistance from the power struggles. Those that uh, are in power and are individuals or structures that do not want you to change, they will kick back. The empire will strike back. That's so what happens when you when you start that first part? How does the resistance begin? What are kind of some things or examples that they might, or, or something that you, when you've done your research and then supported the, that out, the yeah. resistance, in that, especially that first level? Yeah, what, well, the first level is what I call the contributions uh, approach. That's the dimension right here where I saw a lot of teachers at the University of Kansas where they wanted to be uh, in the classroom very soon, but I saw various traits that they had that challenged them to be an effective teacher in the classroom, not just for Native kids, but for all, all kids, particularly of color. And so I really see this as a, as a banking and holding approach. Banking meaning that you just you present information and you just regurgitate the, the information. So you're just poly parroting what you just learned. But there's no critical thinking that goes to that. And I saw a lot of that in NASA, what I call holding things. But my, uh, my descriptors of that. 
Many of them had a captive or colonized mind, or even worse, uh, it was a conquered mind that they, they couldn't think outside of a Eurocentric mainstream, mainstream world. And that uh, they were unaware, un unconscious of significant culture issues in society. They were unreflective thinkers, and that they had a, a dissimulationist behavior, in that their actions were ethnic cheerleading. Ethnic cheerleading is my term for like uh, Native American Month, um, Black History Month, Women's Month, uh, Taco Tuesday, things like that. You get to cheer on this ethnic group this one month, and then after that, they're off the hook. Same old, same old. That's what I call ethnic. And then their race talk is happy talk, meaning they're polite, they're kind to each other. They don't really interrogate and get really into the social discussions about race. So uh, I just thought I'd share those, some of those contributions. And that they have disconscious racism in their, in their action. When I say disconsciousness, I mean D-Y-S, like this, functional. It means that teachers are so far removed from culture, sometimes they don't even know what's right and wrong. See, it's like uh, when I see classroom teachers say, for example, they say, okay, children, let's get in a circle and sit Indian style. And I think, oh my goodness, please don't, teach, please don't do that. And I'm thinking, so, <laughs> so I have to count the coach with them after, you know, class is over, take them to the side, say, you know, what you said, you might not want to do that anymore. She said, what did I do? She said, well, it's a disconscious act of racism. She said, would, for example, would you say to these kids, all right, kids, kids hold hands and sit down, um, black man style. And they said, oh, I would never do that. I well, said, come on, sit down, Mexican style, Asian style, sit down, white man style. She said, but Ms. Smith, you sit down, you said, sit down. Oh, I understand where you're coming from, but he said everybody says that my family is different, but that's why I'm telling you this. This is called disconscious racism, and so they just—they're naive, and they just learn about that. So I'm just sharing you these traits, what I saw, and then there's the mindfulness is more of a, a con, con and it, they're just now discovering that they're decolonizing. Their novice mind. And then you move up to the next level, which is more critical thinking, which is the additive approach in that this point here, this, this level, this dimension. And then they begin to analyze systemic and systemic understanding even more. Now I'm talking about individuals and teachers mostly. And then their approach to decol to deconstruct and change structural framework. Then they start to have a burst of cultural awareness, like, aha, I start to get it now. And then it tries to de de decolonize oneself, but without regular practice. Maybe they find a book. Maybe they find a video or something like that. They, they read. And they, but they still embrace mechanical Eurocentric thinking with fixed structures that like cultural attributes of human living systems. And they begin to mourn, or they begin to uh, become misty because they know they're the coming out of a, a Eurocentric consciousness. And then, so the next level is even more critical thinking. And that's the big, the big part right there. That's the transformation approach, which is a paradigm of conscious, consciousnessation. At that approach, it's about liberatory pedagogy. And then you, you begin to practice decolonization at a regular basis and a regular practice. You got a partner, you got a study group, and you do this all the time. And this is the third level. And it advances, and it, what it does, it, it begins, you begin to mentor other learners because uh, you desire to decolonize their mind. And then you begin to dream of a decolonized world. That's called vision. And then the, the very top uh, dimension is the cultural and social justice action approach, which is the transformation. That's when they approach uh, to indigenous pathways of freedom, intellectual creativity, genius virtues have become second nature, and then you become the teacher of the teachers, and then you you become the protector of sacred knowledge. You engage in insurgent research.
research, you have commitment to action. So those are the descriptors for each one of these dimensions as you move forward. And we work with them through a cohort, what I call cohorts, or metaphorically, uh, canoe cultures, or any, any other society. And we, and we used to do that, and we still do that. I mean, with the Comanches, our, our little cohort was called the Little Ponies, where the Little Ponies were clustered uh, in the ability grouping as the little, little ones, and they were, they were channeled to different uh, uh, knowledge keepers because of their wisdom. And they became the young warriors of their time. They couldn't go on war journeys because they were too young and, and too naive, but they can stay behind in the camp protect all the elders and the babies until there was others that came back to rescue them. That was the society. And the rabbit dance society of the Kai was in the same way. The Shiner Apple had the dog soldiers. And so these are clusters of societies that are very synonymous with these groups, these what I call these cluster groups or cohorts of modeling. So I'm using these kinds of associations to, to try to help understand that we cannot do this decolonization on our own individual self. We have to have partnership. We have to have a cohorts like we traditional were in as, as indigenous people. So that's a, just a real quick uh, glimpse of how I unfold this model. Thank you for explaining that, Dr. Peebleworthy. We appreciate that opportunity just to kind of understand and, and just the explaining that there's a lot sounds like there's a lot of lot of more information that just couldn't be fully explained but again that's why we wanted to kind of visit a little bit and, and kind of learn a little bit more about this this book that is called unsettling settler colonial education we've been talking with dr cornell peeblewordy he's the uh, vice chairman of the comanche tribe but he's been spent Various long career, distinguished career in Portland State. I know him from KU. Uh, very well known singer. Uh, very well known and just supporting the 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 education of, of growing our minds and and helping other people to to be able to do these like unsettlers unsettling settler colonial. Like, boy, that's a tongue pull, doctor. <laughs> who come up with that? That, that, that let's get funny. And who, who come up with that? that's a that's a tongue twister, but that's a well, good one. Well, the, the editors from the uh, Teachers College Press, where we published this, um, I, they said, "What do you want to call this model?" I said, I, "What do you want to title your book?" I said, "I want to unsettle these settlers." So I suggest unsettling settler colonial education. I want to shake it up. I want to shake it up. I want to tell them that, you know, the kind of education that we were designed, it was a design to exting extinguish us, to make us be like everybody else, to be speaking English. And uh, to me, it's about decolonization or extinction. And so this book is shaking it up, providing a decolonized model, not only for personal uh, self, but also for structures, and to try to design system, whether it be a charter school, public school, higher education, tribal college, you know, there is this mechanism that the small can be designed to, to empower those. And this book, it's been out for a while. Can can most people find these books in the bookstore or anywhere? Where can people find this book? Yeah, it came out summer last year, uh, 2022, from uh, Teachers College Press. And uh, you can find them. I, I find them. I, Barnes and Noble, I believe, and yeah. it's actually all over. And, and I, I would recommend many. I've had an, I, just a chance to peruse your personal copy. Thank you, Doctor P. Worthy, for that. <laughs> it, it's very, very eye-opening and and very inform informational. Because again, as I was thinking about when we were doing this interview and talking about it, you know, the tribes that are already using some of this model and how they've used it to come up to what this model has actually helped them to overcome and to achieve. And, and that's where some of the growth, you know, like the bigger tribes that we know who relatively speak their language. And, and you know, it's the challenges for those like our tribes, and I know the Comanche tribe is 
doing really well in their language and the Kiowa tribe were we're turning the corner with our language and those are kind of the things that for me when I think about this unsettling that's part of, of, of that learning too is our language and that, that a key part of that model as well it is and then you'll notice in each one of these chapters each one of the collaborators the writers they introduce themselves in their own language and that's the reason why he did mine and everybody else and, and then too we don't have to subscribe to the very generic writing style Kiowa in this day and age, and you could 
explain it. And you have confidence in who you are. And you have pride in who you are with your, your nationhood that you've just created. So I just wanted to just conclude by saying the language is critical and important, but it's a lifelong journey for many of us that, that did not grow up in, in the immersion in even dual language households because of the inner tribalism that we, we cope with. Powerful words, and we thank you for that. I mean, there's no way to conclude, but better than that, and the one thing, is, like we mentioned, the challenge, this book challenges you. It challenges all of us to unsettling settler colonial education, the transformational indigenous practice model. It's one that you can find everywhere that books are sold, online or in stores we thank you dr p wardy for joining us on the native broadcast network live with the native guy that's me i'm your host and you have a wonderful day we cha wardy